up what I was talking about at the end of class about the research that I've been doing. And then what I wanted to do is cover um, a couple of sort of complexity theoretic properties of approximation algorithms that I meant to do last time but didn't get around to it. And then I'm going to um, talk about Christified's 3 over 2 approximation for traveling salesman tour. So let's quickly review what um, well, the problem was that um, I've been working on. So you have a polygon. And we are assuming that you have a unit square more in the case that I'm going to show you. And the goal is to move this square around so that it covers the entire polygon while minimizing the total amount of tour. And, the, cat, and the, the subtlety is that you're allowed to go outside of the boundary if you need to, OK? OK, so what I did, what we did is um, I said that we're going to put a, a grid on top of the polygon. 
And what we're going to do is we're going to visit all of the necessary nodes on this grid such that um, it will cover the entire problem. Okay? Now, what I did was is I assumed that for a moment we know where the optimal tour is. Okay? This is the optimal tour right here. And what we're going to do is we're going to start shifting the grid okay, slowly over the unit interval, and we're going to start marking up the length of the optimal tour, okay? And if we shift it over the unit interval, what's going to happen is that we're going to cover precisely the length of the tour, okay? So if we wanted to plot out the number of intersections, uh, that OpStar has with the uh, edges of the grid over the unit interval, we're going to have some sort of function whose integral is going to be 1, okay? Because that's going to be the entire tour. <clears throat> and what I, what I was trying to say last time is that if we, if we just randomly plop down uh, a grid setting with respect to the polygon, it's just like choosing a random point on this, okay? And what I was trying to describe last time is that um, in expectation, the point that we choose is going to be um, exactly 1. Okay, it's going to be exactly the length of the optimal tour. Okay, so if we are somehow able to brute force and find the minimal setting that minimizes the number of intersections, what we're going to have is the <coughs> I'll, I'll write it. I'll just write it out. The number of intersections in the <coughs> grid. setting that minimizes erasing that is less than or equal to the length of the optimal tour. Okay? So now the question of course is, you know, obviously we don't know where the optimal tour is, so how on earth can we find, you know, what this minimal grid setting is, okay? Now, I'm, I'm just going to sort of speed through this and, and not be real formal with the proofs so we can just get on to the other stuff. Basically, what we're going to do is, for the moment, we're going to still assume that we know where the optimal tour is. And for each cell on this grid in which the optimal tour passes through, we're going to go ahead and mark the cell. Okay? So, in other words, let's say that the optimal tour looks something like this. I don't know, that's probably not the optimal tour, but you get the idea. What we're going to do is we're going to start marking all these cells. And this one will be marked twice here. Or no, not this one. This one will be marked twice. Okay, something like that. So we're going to have sort of a, a trail of marked cells that's going to correspond to the optimal tour. All right? Now, again, we still don't know where these marked cells are, but what we can make the observation of is for any, um, any node in the grid, let's say that let's choose this one, there's an if and only if relationship where if, um, and I'm not going to prove this, but... Uh, uh, let's say this node is uh, n uh, is within the L infinity distance. Is our polygon here? L infinity distance, which is less than or greater, or less than or equal to one half. If and only if um, n is <coughs> part of at least one mark cell. You guys know what the infinity distance is? Okay. Sort of as a, um, it's basically uh, the distance 
if you if you if you put the square down, okay, the distance up and over, okay. Um, so if you want to think of Euclidean distance, you guys know what that is. That's also known as L2 distance, okay. And if you go to three dimensions, it becomes the L3 distance, okay. So you keep up with the dimensionality. So basically, the the, the L infinity distance is the maximum of uh, the respective uh, directions. So if you go, so if here's your origin and here's your point and you're going up three and over two, the L infinity distance is three. Okay, that's basically what that is. And, th and th it's sort of a, a terse mathematical way to describe the, um, the area in which this uh, square is being covered. Okay, so. Um, I'll just leave it at that. You guys can look it up if you want to uh, know more about that stuff. So, okay. So, what does this mean? So, if we know which nodes are within one half of the L infinity distance of the polygon, then what we can say that is for all n such that. Is less than or equal to one half. <coughs> okay, we'll we'll call this set uh, big M. Then, if we let um, we'll call big C. I don't know where I know. Okay, we'll just call it big C. Is all the all the nodes um, associated with all these marked cells? Okay, so if this is a marked cell, then all four of these nodes are in C. Okay, then we can say that um, C is a subset of N. So while we don't know where these um, <coughs> these marked cells are directly, what we can do is we can find a superset to where if we visit all of these nodes, these nodes, then we're also going to visit all these nodes. Okay, so in particular, a TSP tour of C is going to be less than or equal to a TSP tour of N. Okay, and this guy we can find. Okay, and so basically that's sort of the, the long and short of um, how we got our result. Okay, and we get a two approximation, um, the blow up coming from the number of intersections to tracing, so for each intersection we have to trace the top and both the bottom. Okay, so basically we're, we're encapsulating the optimal tour. Okay. Okay. Any questions about this? I mean, I kind of just whizzed right through it, but that this is basically just um, what Sean and I have been um, doing for the last two years now. Okay. All right. So let's move on then to some. Some complexity results, and I don't know if Chris is going to cover this, so um, I don't think he covered it when I took his class. But it should be interesting because you're probably going to run into this if you start studying algorithms at all beyond this class. Okay, so recall we have P, and then we have NP, okay, and um, I think somebody asked this question last class where what's the difference between MP complete and MP hard? Okay, MP complete is this shell where it's harder than P, okay, we can do a reduction to show that it's MP hard, but we can also show that a uh, polynomial time certificate can be, or a certificate can be verified in polynomial time. Okay, so if you guys remember, if you if you want to do a reduction, you have problem B and you're reducing it to problem A, right? Okay, if you know that um, B is NP is NP hard, right, and you, and you show that it's a subset of this problem by doing the the reduction, then you know that this problem is at least that hard, if not harder. Okay. Now the the last step that you need to do to show that it's NP complete is that if you're given a certificate in A, 
can you show that you can verify in polynomial time? Okay, that confines it into NP complete. Okay, NP hard includes NP complete as well as everything up there on it. Okay. All right. Yeah. Question. No, no, no. As I read about NP hard, it's the the, the NP complete problems are the easiest problems in NP hard. Right. That is, yeah, it's another way of looking at it. Yeah. So if you know B is in uh, NP complete, and you want to prove A is in NP complete, you have to take any question you could possibly ask in B and show that you can transform that into a, a question in A. Right. That'll show that it's if. if if B is NP hard, <clears throat> by doing that, what you just said, that'll show that A is NP hard. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm always confused about the two. It's right. Because you don't want to do it the other way, otherwise you didn't really prove anything. Right. Yeah. Uh, and and the word reduction is kind of a misnomer because it, you're actually it's kind of counterintuitive. I always like to think of the word uh, transformation. Uh -huh. You know, just yeah. So, so the, the verification step, if it takes polynomial time, then it's in NP. What if you don't know how long it takes? What if then is that in NP hard? Yeah, so it's, it's NP hard. It may or may not be NP complete then. What if the verification step takes constant time, then what can you say? Oh, that's fine. Then it's NP complete. This is polynomial. It's still, that's still polynomial. Yeah. Yeah. Did, did Chris cover like uh, NP and co NP at all? Yeah. Is he, is he? Yeah. Okay. 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 So yeah, for example, like um, the, the the converse of SAT, you know, you guys know what SAT is? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So the converse of SAT is show that there doesn't exist um, a Boolean assignment to satisfy all the clauses. Okay. There's no way in polynomial time to verify that that we know of. Because in order to check that, you'd have to check all the possible assignments and to conclude that there isn't any, okay? And that's exponential time, okay? So that would be an instance where that's not in NP, that's in a different class, okay? All right, so what I want to talk about then is let's talk about some problems that are in NP complete, okay? All right, first one I want to, that I want to talk about Let's divide this up here. APX hard. Okay, what is APX hard? It means it's approximately hard to. Okay, in other words, unless P equals NP, there exists no uh, polynomial time algorithm that can even approximate problems of that uh, problem class within a constant factor. Okay, does that all make sense? So, unless P equals NP, then there doesn't exist an algorithm <coughs> that can even approximate a problem instance within k times opt where k is a constant. All right. So basically, these are sort of the, the, the hardest of the <coughs> NP-complete problems, OK? Um, one example that you might know of is, um, that's APX hard, is set cover. OK, set cover is APX hard. And the best known approximation that, that uh, we have is a log n approximation. Okay. In other words, the, the, the approximation bound scales with the input. Okay, that's that's pretty bad. All right. Then in the middle here we have our normal <coughs> k approximation algorithms. Okay, those are the guys that we we generally like to find. Okay, that's yeah. So would you say 
that it's not really useful, um, you know, in practice to run a algorithm which is scales with the input like that. Right. Yeah. I mean, usually when you're dealing with APX hard problems, you're either you're going to one, um, you know, run a heuristic and cross your fingers, hope that it works, okay? Or, and then this is, you'd be surprised how often this happens, um, try to find a restricted version of your more general problem that still works for whatever motivation you're doing your research on and work with that. Okay. Beyond this, that's about all you can do. All right? That's just, I mean, it's just a hard problem. That's, that's, that's all that it is. Okay, so you have your constant, uh, your constant uh, approximation um, problems, and then we have this one in here called, I'm going to write this out, I'll just put there, they're called P-tosses. Okay, P-toss stands for polynomial time approximation scheme. Okay. So it's a scheme. What does a scheme mean? A scheme is a class of algorithms, okay? In particular, the, let me show an example here. Um, so this is, a sample result that, that would be that would fall under, under uh, a p pass. Okay, so you have this this variable epsilon that you get a set. Okay, basically what's going on is the lower you set epsilon, the better your result is, but the longer it's going to take. Okay, this is basically the, the best that we can do without actually <coughs> dropping any p, because we can get arbitrarily close to the optimal solution. And, you know, it, it just depends on how much time you're willing to spend. Yeah? What's epsilon? Is that from 0 to 1? Um, uh, well, uh, it, it can be large. It depends on if it's a minimization or maximization problem. Okay. Um, usually, you want to talk about epsilon that's, you know, definitely less than, less than 1. Epsilon is usually close to 0. Okay, it, it, it just really depends on how good you want the, the thing to be. Now, um, so, see, so theoretically, this is really great. Um, if you can show that an NP-complete problem has a PTOS, I mean, theoretically speaking, that, that problem is basically closed. Okay, there, you can't get any better uh, theoretical result than that. Okay, now the only sort of practical limitation to this is, um, while this can still technically be uh, a polynomial time number, okay, if you get to say n to the 10th, you know, if you boost it up so it's like n to the 10th, I mean, n to the 10th is basically exponential, okay? So, so there's some practical limitations on how close you can really get to the optimal solution. Even though this is still considered to be technically polynomial, I mean, you, you plug 100 in here, you know, and that's a very big number already. So, do you see what I mean? I mean, there's, there's practical limitations to what a PTOS is. Any questions? Yeah. So you're you're in squared there, and yeah, that's that could be any polynomial expression of n, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. So this you just be right poly of n, just whatever that is. And then does your epsilon just add on some large constant, or? Yeah. So in, in particular, if you have a result like this, you want to have usually want to have your epsilon of order n, okay? So you're going to get very, very close as your problem size increases, 
Okay. Now, another form, which is worse, you can also have this kind. Okay. This is still technically a PTOS, although, I mean, that's, that's pretty bad. Okay, because you don't have to make epsilon all that small to make this pretty big. Okay, yeah. so um, in fact, usually when you when you have results like this, a lot of the times in practice, um, people will just you know find some constant factor approximation that runs a lot quicker and just use that. Okay. All right. Okay. So any questions about this stuff? <coughs> So how do you prove something is in one of those? Um, <clears throat> these two are by existence, right? So I mean, if you come up with a K approximation, obviously it's in there. If you come up with a PTOS, obviously it's in it's in PTOS. Here, does anybody have any idea for how you could show that? Give you a hint. It's the same way. You use another APX hard tool. Yeah. Well. Okay. Yeah. So that's one way. But like, how would you make that first initial jump? Oh. Cool. Okay. okay. <laughs> so, so remember the reduction, right? Now this is. Um, I'm not really sure if there are other ways. This is the way that I know that you could do it. Is instead of it being relating optimal solution to optimal solution. You, rate, you relate a um, optimal solutions to a K approximation of the optimal solution. Okay, does that make sense? So in the reduction, one of them is the, the optimal solution, you re, and, then, and then the other side is just a K approximation. Okay, so it's a little bit different, but the, the, the reduction kind of feel is still the same. All right? Have I lost anybody? Does everybody get that? That means <coughs> problem B is subset of the approximation of A? Right. We know B is hard, and we're assuming that we have a K approximation of A. Mm -hmm. Right. Then by doing the result, so if you could even, what that means is if you can get a K approximation of A, then you could solve this MP-complete problem. Is, okay. is what, and okay. that obviously can happen, so. Okay. <coughs> Yeah. So K opt is contained in MP complete. Is that what the top line is? Right. Yeah. yeah. So so finding a K optimal solution is MP complete. Right. All right. Well, um, any other questions before we move on to three over two approximation? Okay. Why is a K optimal MP complete? I mean, does that mean we have a great way to Solve an, an approximation. Sorry, say that again. Confused by the, the syntax. You said a K optimum solution is MP complete. So everything in here is MP complete. Okay. This is. Oh right. You just mean there's a polynomial witness or whatever. What I, what I mean is okay. There, there's no algorithm to solve the problem exactly in polynomial time. Okay. Okay. But in this one, there's a way in polynomial time to approximate it within some constant factor of the optimal solution. Here I'm saying you can't even do that. Okay? You're going to have something like this, probably. Okay? Yeah? So is there a simple proof of why k op can't approximate something outside of it be complete? Well, I mean, the, the reduction would show that, right? Anybody else? All right. So let's erase this then. And I'm going to give you Christify's 3 over 2 approximation for TSP. We'll go through that, and then we'll be done for the day. Okay. Everybody know what TSP is? I have a question. Yes. Since uh, approximation uh, problems are uh, MP-complete, that means that they can be reduced to any MP-complete problem. 
Right. Does that mean that all of them can be uh, approximation problems? No. So the, the important thing to remember about reductions is that you're only relating optimal solutions to opti optimal solutions. Yeah. Okay. It says absolutely nothing, in the traditional sense at least, about the approximations. Okay. In particular, with the, the fact, the very existence that there's ones that are inapproximable and those that are, shows that some reductions destroy the approximability okay. when you do the reduction. Okay. Right. Yeah, that's a very good point. All right. Um, does everybody know what TSP is? Do I have to define that? Raise your hand if you don't know what TSP is. I know what it is, but, you know, okay. exactly yeah. what it is. Okay. So let's... <clears throat> okay. Let G equals D E E uh, graph find the uh, shortest tour that I should. Well, maybe, maybe not. It doesn't have to be weighted, but that visits every. Okay. That's basically what TSP is. Now, there's variations of this. Um, there's a sort of a more restricted sense where you can visit each one exactly once. That's Hamiltonian circuit. <coughs> Um, and then I left it open here because you can have weights on the edges. You can just have unit weights or undirected. Um, and the one that I'm going to talk about is a certain um, subset of this where you're going to have edges E, or I should say the the weights of weights W little e a triangle inequality. So it's a restriction on the general form of TSP, but a very uh, still widely used um, problem that applies to a lot of different places. Does everybody know what the triangle inequality is? Mm -hmm. Raise your hand if you don't know what the triangle inequality is. Okay, so we're going to have a graph that obeys, whose edge weights obey, uh, obey the triangle inequality. And what we're going to do is we're going to generate a 3 over 2 approximation <coughs> for this. Okay? Is it the same as saying it's in an Euclidean space? Not quite. It's close. Um, that, that's even a, a further restriction. Okay? Um, with, with the triangle inequality, there's a little bit of wiggle room. All right? Because all you have to do is show that, you know, the the, the hypotenuse is uh, strictly less than the, 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 the two sides. The sum of the two sides? Right. <clears throat> okay. So, so let's think about this. Maybe you guys can figure this out. What would be, so we can't solve the TSP tour exactly. Okay. But we're going to come up with an approximation to it. And we can't use the optimal solution directly as for our result. What would be uh, something that we could use that we can find that we could use to build our uh, analysis on? What algorithm or what are you talking yeah, about? Yeah, yeah. Some, something that something that's true of a graph that we can do that would be a good approximation to a traveling salesman tour yeah. that we can find in polynomial time. Minimum spanning tree. Minimum spanning tree, great. Um, uh, you have to use a greedy method? Yep, greedy, uh, Kruskal's method works fine. So um, does everybody know 
what Kruskal's algorithm is? Yes? So basically, yeah, you just take the, the minimum weighted edge, you put it in there, and you just keep doing that. If it makes a cycle, you, you skip that one and move on to the next highest. Okay? So what we're going to do now is I'm just going to sketch out what our algorithm is going to be. So T is our minimum spanning tree. Is that vertices and edges? Right. So the, the, the way I, I found this reference was they denote it as this is the minimum spanning tree. Okay. So you have the original vertices. Here's here's the um, your minimum spanning tree. Okay. Matching. M. We'll call that M. Minimal Okay, so this is the algorithm for the 3, or two, three over 2 approximation. But first of all, can anybody from, uh, from just this give me a, a quick and dirty um, 2 approximation? Right, yeah. You, so, so you have your minimum spanning tree and you just double all the edges. Okay, you just go there, come back. Okay, two approximation because the minimum spanning tree is obviously less than any tour, which, if you take away an edge, becomes a spanning tree. Okay, so let's go through this then. So, we're going to denote the, the subset O as the set of vertices with odd degree. Everybody know what odd degree is? Okay, as a, a vertex has odd number of edges coming out of it. Okay, so we have this set O in our minimum spanning tree, and what we're going to do is we're going to find a perfect matching. Okay, have you guys covered what a perfect matching is yet? 
Don't you have to have some sort of bipartite graph to do that? Uh, it works with bipartite graphs, but that's not the only graph that it works on. Okay. Okay. So perfect matching is um, based. Let's see, I have it right here. Can I erase this? Yeah. I bummed all these definitions off of uh, Wiki. That's about it. That's all I really need. So, in other words, if you have okay, and you have these edges, a perfect matching is then to choose this one, this one, and this one. Okay. Now the thing with um, it's almost like vertex cover. Yeah. Yeah, um, except the, the, the added restriction is that you can't have two edges that are together. That's good. That are adjacent? Yeah, that are adjacent. Okay. Right, yeah, adjacent. <coughs> okay. Yeah, it's also known as edge independent set. Go ahead, let's go. Yeah. Alrighty, so, okay. So, and I'm, I'm just going to state this without proof that there's a way to find a perfect matching with um, odd degree vertices in our minimum spanning tree in polynomial time. Okay? Um, so, so you're guaranteed that this, uh, this set is connected? Yeah, so uh, I forgot to mention that it's going to be, a, um, our graph is going to be a complete graph. Okay. okay. Every vertex has an edge between it. Okay. Which graph is a complete graph? So that that basically means that every ver every two vertices there's a, an edge between it. There's no sparsity at all. Okay. So your set O represents a complete graph. Yeah. No. So O is um, okay. So we have our complete graph, and then we have our minimum spanning tree. I mean, the okay. TSP problem itself is a complete graph. What's yeah. that? I mean, the, the original graph is a complete graph. Right, the original graph is a complete graph. But that's another restriction, right? The right. But, yeah, so, um, but, uh, th I mean, that's it's a very common thing. So, I mean, it is restrictive, but there's plenty of applications to where, you know, this subset of this problem is worth looking at, okay? Yeah, it's important to note that Christified's um, heuristic does not work on general TSP. Okay, yeah. Could you make it look like a regular TSP by just putting like infinite distances between or an infinite weight on edges between two? Well the problem with that is then you're not obeying the triangle inequality anymore. Right. Good good idea though. All right, so so let's let's go through this. I'm gonna I'm gonna write this out. We're gonna show why we get a three over two approximation with this. Okay. Set of the optimal solution for TSP or G. It stays connected. 
contains some spanning tree. Is A a uh, cycle? Yes, it has to be because it's a traveling salesman tour. Okay. Yep. Thus, the total edge weight of A is going to be bound by the total edge weight of T, which is our minimum spanning tree. We've already, we've already said that. Also going to denote set B Okay, so B now is a restriction. Okay, we're running, we're considering the TSP tour on O. Okay, not just the complete graph anymore. Okay. And then it follows that So far, so good? All right. And I'm already going to, I'm just going to, uh, we state without proof that there exists a perfect matching. Vertices from O with weight okay. So if you want to think about a perfect matching, if you have a cycle and you're choosing every other one, okay, there, there's two possible ways to do that, right? Just just go over by one. You start with the odd one. Okay, there's two perfect matchings on, on a cycle. Clearly, if you choose the minimal of the two, that it's going to be no greater than half of the total cycle, right? Does that make sense? Because <coughs> you're cutting off at least half of the... Total edge weights, yeah. So I think I missed it. When you say weight of B, but B are vertices, so what's the weight of the vertex? Um, let's see here. B is edge set. Yeah, it's an edge set. B as the edge set. Sorry, so, what so was, then A was also the optimal solution. Though. Right, that's, a, that's an edge set as well. Right, it, it doesn't make sense to define right. A vertice set for TSP because that's just going to be all of them, right? You're, you're just interested in the edges. But they're both the optimal TSP solution. Right, for over two different um, domains, if you will. B is like a, a, a subset, right? Over just the edges that are connected to the odd degree vertices in the graph. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah, basically, you just get if you really want to get a hold of what's going on. You just got to stare at it a little bit, and then it becomes pretty intuitive. Okay. What if all of your vertices? Well, I guess that's impossible. Never mind. That that is possible. If all your vertices are of odd degree. Yeah, because it's a it's a complete graph. Well, we're talking about though in, in the minimum spanning tree. Oh. Okay, odd degree in there. Right. So obviously there's going to be all the leaves, for example, are odd degree. And there may be some odd degree vertices mixed in between. Okay? 
And, I, and I'm skipping a little bit of details in there as to why that matching, the perfect matching part works. But if you really are curious, you can, you guys know how to use a computer. So, okay. Um, we state again without proof that the number of that the cardinality of O is even. Okay. And this is just a property of spanning trees in general. Okay. There's always going to be an even number of odd degree vertices. All right. That's just a property of spanning trees, and I'm not going to prove that either. Okay, so let note E1 e to the 2K as the only path in the multi-set or in O B. Okay, so let me just stop here and I'll just sort of say in words what is written down here. Basically what we're gonna do is we have our minimal matching on the odd degrees on the odd degree vertices. Okay? And that matching, if we add that back into the minimum spanning tree, is going to turn all of those odd degree vertices into even degree vertices. Okay? So what we're doing is we're taking the, the minimum spanning tree, we're taking our perfect matching from all the odd degree vertices, and we're just slapping them on top of one another. Okay? So now we have a multigraph. Multigraph meaning that we can choose a particular edge more than once, okay? You're duplicating. Right, so we're, yeah, we're duplicating edges. So yeah, I mean, however you want to think about it. So, and it's, it's a, another property of graphs where if you have um, an edge set where every uh, vertice has even degree, then there exists a Eulerian path, yeah. okay? which is where you visit all of the edges, in this case, an edge more than once, because it's a multigraph, okay? And what we have here for our bound is one plus one half, okay? So, in other words, we're getting a factor of one from, from our minimum spanning tree and a factor of one half from our perfect matching. That's the uh, less than or equal to WA over 2, where WA is the way to the optimal. Right. This is our perfect matching result right there. Yep. Okay. So since we're covering them both, and, it, and we know these, these bounds are both bounded respectively by, um, by the, their respective traveling salesman tours, therefore we can say that we have a 3 over 2. Approximation. Approximation. Okay. Any questions? Yeah, the yes. cardinality of, of O has to be even because otherwise you cannot have perfect matching, right? Yes, that's also that's also true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's we're we're conveniently uh, grabbing some properties of uh, spanning trees in this case. It just happens just to follow very naturally. If that weren't the case, we probably wouldn't have this result. All right. Um, any questions about anything? So, so you're saying being in minimum spanning tree, they got to be even number of odd degree vertices. Right. That's true of any spanning tree, not just the minimum one. Yeah. OK, well, um, I guess that's, unless anybody else wants to talk about something else, 
that's all I have for today. I want to let you guys out early. Sound good? How about next class? Next class? Is it uh, Chris going to be here or no? Uh, I don't think so. I'm going to email him today and ask him what he wants me to talk about on Tuesday. Let's do homework. Huh? Talk about the homework? No. And you know, I'll tell you what, I'll throw that by him and see what he says. Now, I haven't looked at the homework. You know, I may, I'm not the professor here. I may or may not know all these problems. It's been a while since I've looked at them, but, you know. All right, well, have a good day. Enjoy your extra 25 minutes. I I'm going to look at it again.